those last few sentences of Ingridge were very well put. Um, I like to think of these dung beetles that I've been involved with for 50 years as having, um, uh, as one of God's gifts to us humans, particularly living here in Australia. Um, now, <coughs> that, that, that type of scene there, where Australians are eating outdoors, uh, particularly during the summer months in Australia, was a very rare situation and a rare scene until about 25 years ago. And the reason for it being almost impossible was because of the world renowned or the well known Australian bushfly. Now, <coughs> here in Canberra is a prime example of just how effective these dung beetles have been, and the situation will improve as time goes on. I can see in the audience not many of you would have been here in Canberra 25 and 30 years ago. However, the situation was such at that time that it was actually illegal for a restaurant to place a table outdoors and serve any type of meal at all outdoors. The reason for it being illegal was that 500 bushflies would descend upon your meal. And the health department considered it a health hazard and banned the serving of meal outdoors completely. Uh, <coughs> There, they are, there is the scene of the Australian bushfly. Um, they breed in unburied cow dung in the farmer's paddocks. Now, a, a, two litres of good quality dairy dung can easily turn out two to 3,000 bushflies per cow pad. Now, every animal on this, every cow on this country, in this country, is dropping 12 of those cow pads per day. Each of those bushflies lives for about three weeks. So if you have a calculator big enough, you could calculate just how many bushflies can survive in this country. Now the type of dung certainly influences the number of bushflies that can <coughs> survive eating cow dung. Poor quality cow dung may only turn out 500 flies. You can see this is good quality dairy dung. <coughs> it, it was collected at Fishwick here in Canberra, you can see seeds in the dung. Those flies are attracted to the dung and they're feeding on the leftover protein <coughs> from the grass. The cattle remove only approximately 60% of the protein in the grass that they consume. So the other 40% goes through the animal and gets dumped on the ground. And bush flies, dung beetles, uh, internal parasite, and many other organisms live on that leftover protein. Now once these flies have had a meal, they then, the females, lay a cluster of eggs in a little crevice in the dung. Those eggs hatch after about 12 hours and then the larva require six days in an undisturbed cow pad to survive. And this is where the weak link in their survival. And this is where the dung beetles come in. Dung beetles can quite easily bury or shred cow dung, a cow pad, in 24, 48 or 72 hours. In fact, I have seen dung disappear in paddocks sometimes when beetles are working well in a matter of hours. They just simply put it underground and remove the breeding ground. But any burial of the dung in less than 72 hours is more, more than acceptable to uh, control these flies. Now, this young lady is my daughter, Sandra, and it demonstrates just how these bushflies do spoil the great outdoors in Australia. <laughs> my daughter couldn't stand the flies on her face. She'd put a cap over her face, and then in amongst pleas of hurry up, Dad, <clears throat> I told her to, to use her left arm and put the cap back in place and pretend to be reading the newspapers. <laughs> now, now these bushflies are attracted to humans and other mammals and they're seeking protein and chemicals from tears, saliva, perspiration and of course any open wound. And um, they've evolved in such a way that when they do 
find a mammal on this continent, they stay with the mammal. So that's why they feed around our face and then they'll sit on our back or stay with us until they get hungry again. <coughs> My daughter, by the way, likes to remind me whenever I use this photograph just how much money Bill McPherson would have charged my company to endure that level of torment. And being the good father I am, I not only didn't give it to Bob, I told her to lay there, be quiet and stay still. <laughs> now, <coughs> the situation in Australia began to <coughs> change dramatically when Captain Philip turned up with the first fleet. He had with him seven horses, seven, uh, 44 sheep, and seven head of cattle. And it's the cattle that have now increased in numbers to 28 million cattle on the country. Would you believe they drop 300 million cow pads each day? And that equates to half a million tonnes of cow dung a day is being dropped on this tired, burnt out continent that we live on. Now we're bringing phosphate fertilizers from Florida, Canada, Russia, China and Morocco to Australia. And here we are, we have half a million tonnes of one of nature's valuable products <coughs> already on the farms. It's already in the paddocks. It's already spread. The only trouble is it sits on top of the ground <coughs> and goes to waste. Now, any time you're travelling around Australia and you see a situation like that, Think of it as being a massive wasted resource, particularly on this tired, burnt out country. We need every gram of that material being put underground and put to good use. This is another scene taken near the Queensland border. And again, we have that, that, that amount of dung probably represents only the grazing over the five or six months of the summer season in that location. But again, it demonstrates just how much dung is <coughs> dropped in a paddock. Now, when dung sits on top of the ground like that, about 80% of the nitrogen in the dung goes off into the atmosphere. When dung beetles bury that dung, you can actually reverse that figure. You have 20% off into the atmosphere and 80% of the nitrogen is put under the grass roots. Now, I like pointing out to farmers that not even these very clever tractor engineers and farm implement engineers, <coughs> could they make a machine that a farmer could drag around his paddock every fortnight throughout the year and that machine would put that down back underground as easily and as efficiently as dung beetles do. Uh, another issue, when <coughs> dung sits on top of the ground, Internal parasites complete their life cycle, they develop into larva, those larva then crawl out onto the grass, lay more eggs and the <coughs> life cycle is completed. The animals then eat grass with those eggs on it and hence the whole cycle is complete. And uh, farmers have to use uh, expensive amounts of um, uh, uh, drenches to combat the internal parasite issue. The dung is polluting the paddock and then it gets washed into the creeks and rivers. Now there's another terrible insect that breeds in unburied cow dung and that is the buffalo fly in Northern Australia. Each one of those flies breeds, sucks blood about 30 times a day. Now the level of uh, <coughs> irritation isn't as bad as a mosquito, but it will certainly make you flinch. And if you have three, four or 5,000 of those bush flies <coughs> on an animal, I can assure you the amount of stress that it produces is extreme. And <coughs> once again, farmers have to use some pretty nasty chemicals to combat that fly. Cattle will fail to put on 40 odd kilograms of weight per season if they're not protected <coughs> against those flies. <laughs> and the dung beetles also perforate the ground with millions and billions of holes. Now, when farmers use fertilisers and we have nutrients from dung and other sources running into creeks and rivers, <coughs> those phosphates and nitrates produce these blue-green algal blues. So if we can keep these, the, the dung and perforate the paddocks, with holes, much of these chemicals and nutrients will stay in the soil rather than getting into our waterways. This is a little country, st a mountainous stream 
You would expect it to be clean and pristine, but there it is, polluted with nutrient runoff from farmland. <coughs> now, the, um, we're quite fortunate that uh, a Dr. Bornemisser, that is him there, he was a Hungarian immigrant. He came to Australia in the early 50s. Uh, he was a coleopterist in Hungary. Uh, he uh, worked in a location about 100 kilometres east of Perth for about two years. Uh, the bushfly problem in Western Australia is about four times worse than what it is here, over here in the east. He was amazed to see so much unburied dung sitting in the paddocks. He quickly realised that all these flies were breeding in it. And so he set about <coughs> trying to convince authorities that we could handle this problem here. He joined CSIRO, and in 1965, he, um, in 1965, he um, went, went to Africa, and he began looking at what species were available in Africa. Now, we worked in reverse. If, he needed, if we needed dung beetles for the ACT, or the Southern Tableland type climate, he found a Southern Tableland type climate in Africa, he looked at what beetles were available. He selected the best. They were bred. Thousands of eggs were produced. And to prevent any unwanted bacteria or virus coming to Australia, each of those eggs was immersed in a formalin solution for three minutes. And then the eggs only came to Australia. Now, this was designed to prevent any unwanted bacteria or viruses getting, coming to Australia. Now that's just a cross-section of the dung beetles that were available. There's some 5,000 different species in Africa. In quarantine in Australia, these eggs were processed and eventually we ended up with a few hundred beetles. We then bred them. They were released on farms and we now simply harvest these beetles and distribute them around the country in climates similar to that that they were taken from in Africa. Now, um, we, I, I feel when the funding stopped at CSIRO, there was, there was just one of 44 species that were released that had been spread to its climatic and geographic limits. The other 43 species were quite often just sitting in valleys, on properties, waiting for somebody to pick them up and put them into a similar climate elsewhere around the country. And that's what I now do for the last 22 years since leaving CSIRO. Now this, this is a species of dung beetle, <coughs> they, um, it works during the winter months, it's quite an extraordinary insect, it works in southern Australia and it becomes active when it gets wet, cold and miserable, could you believe it? But anyhow, <coughs> we're, we're fortunate to have, it's the only one of two species that bury dung in the winter months. Now these beetles, I harvest these beetles, they're taken by House of Hackett here in Canberra, and uh, the beetles are different species are separated. They're then uh, washed, their numbers are calculated through weight, and the farmers are very eager to get their whole hands on these beetles. Now, that photograph there is, uh, as uh, Stephen mentioned earlier on, we um, have a highlight in our life. Well, that is my highlight, would you believe it? <laughs> I've been working 50 years and I have hundreds of photographs of that. I can't resist walking past cow dung, which contains large numbers of beetles, without taking a photograph of it. Uh, now, each of these species of dung beetles, or many of them, different species of dung beetles have different flight times. Some species fly in the morning, others midday, others dusk, and others during the night. Now, I know when all these different species fly, so we attack and or hit a paddock soon after the completion of their flight period. They're in the dung and they're doing exactly what the bushfly does. They're seeking protein from the dung and they are producing that sort of tunnel system underneath the dung. Now, an agronomist could quite easily speak about this photograph for at least an hour. <laughs> this, uh, this distance from the top here to the bottom is approximately 300 millimetres. The distance from side to side is approximately 700 millimetres. Now there's a whole lot of magnificent things going on here. First of all, the tunnel system aerates the soil. 
Each one of these balls of dung has a little it has an egg laid in it by the female. It hatches, feeds on the food source, develops into another beetle, crawls to the surface and flies off and repeats the whole process. Now you can imagine what a beautiful absorption system this is for rainwater to get into the soil rather than cascading off. And um, this is also a great habitat and food supply for earthworms. Uh, another magnificent thing that happens is that microbial activity develops and thrives in this region and microbes can store CO2 in the soil just as well as plankton can in the ocean. This is where we can put enormous amounts of CO2 on this continent. Um, the beetles also turn over the topsoil. For every litre of dung that the beetles bring down into the soil, they take up two kilograms of soil back to the surface. It's also a beautiful habitat for earthworms. Just imagine if that tunnel system That tunnel system was going on underneath all of that dung there. Just imagine how healthy that paddock would become in four years, six years and eight years. And again, that's without big tractors, hundreds of dollars of fuel and dozens of hours of a farmer's time. That's as good as it ever gets. Now this tunnel system is what the Water Catchment Authority should be very interested in. When we do have <coughs> heavy rain, uh, have 50 mils of rain in an hour or so in Australia, that rain is washing from the paddocks herbicides, insecticides, wetting agents, valuable fertilisers, or organic matter from dung and other sources. Now when the paddocks are perforated with billions of those holes, those nutrients and chemicals simply get down the holes and the soil then acts as a filtration system and we end up with much cleaner, clearer water in the creeks and rivers. Um, in fact, I have about seven species of dung beetles thriving on a property down in Howell. I went onto the property not long ago and um, I said to them, I'm surprised your dams weren't full of after all that heavy rain. They then told me that I was the problem. I was the cause of the dams not filling up. Uh, because the water was so, rainwater was soaking into the soil. Uh, but the farmer told me that the, the, the dams fill up one or two or four or five days later when the water seeps out of the hill. So this is the answer to nutrient runoff from farmland. I can't come up with any single other thing that can achieve that on farmland. And that will enable our streams estuaries, rivers and oceans to remain nutrient free. I think, oh, no, three, three little requests. I hope whenever you encounter, whenever you're speaking to somebody and that's an influential person, ask them do they know anything about dung beetles. If not, try and educate them now that you know a little about them. The second request is, second request is that um, if you're on holidays and driving around a country road and there's some cow down on the road, I'd like you to deviate around and miss it. Now, even if there's a policeman behind you and he pulls you up and wants to know what on earth is going on, just tell him you're under instruction from John, the dome bird line, to miss the dome back there. Now, you can rest assured that that policeman has never heard of that excuse during his entire career. <laughs> So with a good smile, you may get off. <laughs> now, I do have a little display uh, table out here. If anybody wants further information, you're welcome to come during intermission and I will try and teach you more. I do have pin specimens, live beetles, illustrations, etc. And anything, anyone that says anything negative about these dung beetles out here, please expect a handful down the back of your neck. <laughs> So be warned. <laughs>